Tonight is a very, very special night for me and for Ted Leaf and for this community to welcome uh, one of my heroes, Dr. Rami Nashashibi. Rami has served as the executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network since its incorporation as a nonprofit in January 1997. He has a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and has been an adjunct professor at various colleges and universities across the Chicagoland area where he has taught a range of sociology, anthropology, and other social, social science courses. He has worked with several leading scholars in the area of globalization, African-American studies, and urban sociology, and has contributed chapters to edited volumes by Manning, Maribel, and Saskia Sassen. Rami has lectured across the United States and Europe on a range of topics related to American Muslim identity, community activism, and social justice issues, and is a recipient of several prestigious community service and organizing honors, including the Norman R. Bobbins Fellowship, presented at the most recent Chicago Neighborhood Development Awards. Rami and his work with Iman have been featured in many national and international media outlets, including the BBC, PBS, and a front page story in the Chicago Tribune. In 2007, Islamica magazine profiled Rami as being among the 10 young Muslim visionaries shaping Islam in America. And recently, Chicago Public Radio has selected Rami Nashashibi as one of the city's top 10 Chicago global visionaries. Rami was named one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Studies Center in concert with Georgetown's Prince Awalid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He was also invited by the governor of Illinois to serve on the Commission for the Elimination of Poverty. And all of that, Rami lives with his wife and three children on Chicago's southwest side and not just anywhere in the southwest side, in the thick of the southwest side. So if you could please give a warm round of applause to welcome our brother, Dr. Rami. What is it, Rami, that got you so interested in social justice work, and what has informed that desire to be so heavily involved in it Maybe you can begin by just telling us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and then how you end up doing the work that you uh, have done, your early life, your family, your, your travel, et cetera. And I'm also interested to know how your faith as a Muslim has informed that work and informed your career choice. Peace and blessings be upon you all. Uh, first, before I answer that or even attempt to give you, to me, what are kind of some more of the mundane details of my not so extraordinary life. Um, you know, after all that's said and done, I think we are people who are just attracted to beauty and light and love. And whether we do that in the guise of Muslims, uh, Christians, Jews, human beings, we want that. Um, I happen to believe that in spite of any of the challenges in the Muslim community, that, um, that the Muslim community globally, locally, is just capable of extraordinary love. Uh, so I thank you all for that, and I thank you um, just uh, for allowing me here this evening. Um, to the question uh, about my life and what kind of drove me to do some of the work that I've done with the Iman, our social justice work. Um, I, so I was, uh, my family, my family's Palestinian. Uh, my mother was born in May of 1948. And uh, my mom was actually born kind of like in this very, you know, biblical dirt road type of on the voyage from one village to the other. They called her jihad. and. Anyway, she became the eldest of six. Then to come to my, my grandparents' family was, you know, this is on my mom's side, the refugees for a while, went to different places, and then became one of the first real Palestinian families to settle into the southwest side of Chicago. Um, and my mom, you know, grew up uh, the eldest of six and uh, kids who kind of started at that time, really fending for themselves. There weren't many Muslims dealing with race and the kind of hyper, hyper segregated city dynamics of a space like the south side of Chicago. Um, 
all of all of her brothers' names, and they quickly kind of just really morphed into the street. The brothers became real street hustlers, kind of gangster types who fit into wherever they could fit into. Uh, all of them going from Moe's to Mohammeds to Moe's to Mickey's to Joey's to, you know, Dawood went to Dowd. A lot of white Irish kids around at the time. So my uncle grew up with a name like Mickey Dowd, you know? <laughs> <laughs> very, very typical Southwest Side white Irish kid. My father comes from a very kind of classical Jerusalem family, Neshashibi family, and one, one person that always jokes with me about that is Imam Zaid, because the Neshashibis had this famous rivalry with the Husseinis hmm. in, in Jerusalem. And anytime Imam Zaid is kind of joking with me about not being in touch with him, he always goes like, you're treating me like an Husseini. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and Sheikh Hamza, the first time I ever sat with Sheikh Hamza, he was, and he, he says it till this very day. And Sheikh Hamza, as many of you know, like, Every conversation that I have with Sheikh Hamza, always, without fail, I don't care what he's calling or what I'm talking to him about, without fail, will begin with a meditation on my last name. Neshashibi. Mm. Neshashibi. <laughs> Sounds Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but then he says, no, 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 really. It comes from the word neshab. Arrow makers, mm. Fletcher, Fletcher. That's the English equivalent. You would be a Fletcher, mm. right? So, <laughs> but so the Neshashibis were, were, in fact, arrow makers with the army of Salah al-Din as they came into Jerusalem, and that's where they got their name. So that's my family sister. My, my father, though, um, but I, so I was born, my parents divorced at a young age. My mother kind of then remarried my, so I didn't grow up really with an ounce of kind of any religious instruction. Um, and I, I think the first time I walked into a mosque was probably 19. The first time I even opened the Quran was around that age. So I grew up very disconnected from the Muslim community. And the other thing, part of my, my, my uh, upbringing was I was bouncing around the world a lot because my, my father, may Allah have mercy on him, was I was born in Jordan. Um, my father was a diplomat for the Jordanians, so they were moving around between Romania and, you know, he was in Japan, Tunis, and, you know, so I would go see him, and then my stepfather works for Raytheon, which some of you may know is kind of this mega military industrial complex company, mm. right, so that sells armaments and, and weapons across the world, but they, so he jumps around. Finally, I came to the United States in 1990, it's not, I, before that, I had not been living here. My mother, the only time we came, really, was occasionally visit family in Chicago. But I finally came on my own, just kind of, you know, was really at a stage in my life, didn't know what I was going to do. Came to the U.S. Uh, the Gulf War was in full effect, right, was about to kind of kick off. And again, being Arab, being Palestinian, kind of setting things off. But the first thing I confronted, really, was race in America. Hmm. And what it meant, you know, when I came to a city like Chicago and I was being told by certain people not to go to this part of town or this, I just had not been brought up with that. And um, I didn't understand it. And so I really wanted to understand it. Long story short, I just started gravitating intensely towards attempting to understand that um, and found myself in the company of people who came from more black militant nationalist perspectives. I became very attracted to black nationalism, um, became very attractive. Uh, one of my first real mentors was a former Panther who just was working at a factory all night long. And I would go literally almost every night he was at work with a notebook, stay up all night with him. He would then, after he was done from his shift, take me around neighborhoods, introduce me to the gang topography in the city of Chicago. All of that really fascinated me and eventually led me to, to those types of individuals who embraced Islam. By this point, I had really saw religion purely through the lens of an agnostic who saw some good in it, but more, more harm, more institutionalized BS, honestly. What I saw in Italy, what I saw in, I was in Saudi Arabia for a little bit. And so I just honestly thought anyone who messed with religion seriously was just either doing it from a, just a, a mentally challenged perspective. 
right? Either they were inheriting something because they were just doing it a perfunctory, you know, or they, they had some issues. Mm -hmm. And so the, when these Black Panthers started challenging me, saying, well, you're Muslim, I said, well, you know, my family, and it's, you know, I literally, I just couldn't understand why they took Islam seriously, mm -hmm. you know, from a social justice perspective, from anything. And um, I think my first time I opened up a Quran, honestly, was to debate these guys. Eventually, though, and it wasn't oh, an overnight epiphany, it was just eventually um, things started breaking down. And, and I think, you know, I just got to a point where the intersection of spirituality with political movement, with social justice, it, it didn't happen in one moment. It didn't happen, you know, over, it didn't over, over one conversation. It really all evolved naturally. I was very, this entire time, I was always very involved, right? I was always very active. Um, I was one of those things, that, I was one of those people who had to reflect on the logical cohesion of the argument of religion, right, and the Quran. I had to really kind of, I had to spend a lot of time wrestling with the real idea that there is a book that actually comes revealed from God. That was just a foreign concept to me. So I was, I, was in the, I was in the midst of coming to terms with all of that. And I think I was in one of those states, one of those nights where I was with, and again, I was in exploring all this stuff. Um, and I was with my mother, and we were driving one of these old school. We were in Indiana. And it was late at night. Um, and uh, she was driving. And it was one of those old school Buick LeSabers. You've mm. seen those like tanks cars and we're driving down the highway and it's like a dark road area and uh, all of a sudden we see like a flash of light and I'm like an old man in our lights and then I hear boom and, and and my mom pulls over the side of the road and she's like oh my god I just killed someone and you know and I walk over to the guy and I see this you know badly badly injured, you know, very deformed body on the ground, breathing, and it was really one of my first engagements with that sight, and knowing, and just thinking about the implications of what this could mean, and, you know, it was, I think it was that moment, and, and then just made, probably that was my most sincere, and one of the only times I made a really strong, strong invocation to God, if you let this man live, right, it's over, right? Uh, this is, you know, and uh, alhamdulillah, he lived. Uh, and, and, um, and I think that was a moment, that, that moment after that kind of led to a whole bunch of other things. So you have this <clears throat> personal experience. You come from this great family with all of this pain and beauty you are beginning to engage religion from the lens of politics and social justice. Now, I'm assuming somewhere along that point, you now commit to make this your life's work, because you've definitely done that. But I want you to contextualize this whole conversation for us in the historical context of Chicago. And really tell us a little bit, if you can, how has Islam developed in the time that you've been there? Yeah, well, you know, I, th I think, with all due respect to those of you in the Bay, that, um, Chicago is perhaps... You outnumbered now. I know I'm outnumbered. I'm going to say something. <laughs> I'm going to say something that... I'm, these are not fighting words. This is just, uh, just an assertion. Um, I, I really do think if... I think Chicago, uh, to say it mildly, represents a really critical part of the larger American narrative. And I think that's true also for the Muslim community. If you understand what happens in Chicago or what how the Muslim community has evolved in Chicago. I think you, uh, you, you, you acquire extraordinary insight into Islam in America and both our challenges and, and our opportunities. Number one, for instance, you know, most of the immigrant families, and I'm, I'm looking out, I assume, uh, among some of our brothers and sisters here, there's a, a, a fair number of you who have some of that background. You probably date, your parents probably date their point of 
origin in this country more than likely to a post-1965 moment, right? Uh, that is not a coincidental moment. You know, we have extraordinary historic civil rights legislation that gets passed in America. And it's funny because we don't, we always, we often don't make this connection, but the quotas for immigrants that were set in 1924 under this Naturalization Act in America to restrict immigration to primarily Western European countries was in effect until up until 1964. Uh, part of the pressure and the groundswell and the transformative movement of the civil rights era helps to shift that. And the, under the Johnson administration, they lift that. And for the first time, you begin to see, Af you know, you begin to see Arabs, subcontinent, and most uh, immigrants who are coming, many who are upwardly bound, very different from the type of immigrants that were going into Europe. But when you came into 1965 and you were upwardly mobile, into the era of Mad Men America, right? You are, you are at a moment of white flight. You're also in the moment of, honestly, deindustrialization. So you come to America, proximity to whiteness is an unspoken key to success, right? All that to say, it's not coincidental that in many urban centers like Chicago, the first suburbs that you saw created, uh, the first kind of set of immigrants that lived in those suburbs outside of white populations that were fleeing kind of the urban communities were often Muslims, hmm. right? Um, building these pretty nice schools and masajid and, and, and doing extraordinary work to do so, but building a very separate reality. Whereas you, what you have happening at that moment in the evolution of African-American Islam is a commitment on some part to the urban centers that birthed Islam in America, hmm. really and this commitment to make those centers work because Islam's legacy in America was in part hinging on its ability to be an absolute inspirational transformative force hmm. in these centers, right? It was black migration up into Detroit, into Chicago, into Cleveland. They found, you know, uh, these were people who were a generation removed from slavery, still kind of had sharecropping in their minds and the, the, the oppression of those systems and Islam became what confronted them in these urban centers and helped transform not only their mental psychological states, but the very environments in which these people lived. Mm. So you have that history juxtaposed with immigrant history. By the 90s, the interesting thing that you had was three kind of layers. Now you had a first generation, if you will, of children born from these immigrants, now in their 20s, going to universities. So for the first time, you're confronting your identity outside the more sheltered environment of the mosque, the school, the white suburb that you were living in. Secondly, you had another subset of immigrants that didn't really come with the upwardly bound trajectory that mm. found themselves living in some of these urban centers, like Palestinian refugees or immigrants that, that were living in centers alongside pockets of urban poverty, black and Latino communities. And you had a generation of now Imam Muhammad's community and African-American Muslims coming from the Dar and all those experiences, their children, who are also now of age to think about their experience outside the immediacy of that particular experience. The confluence of all those three kind of, if you think about them, streams, right. happening right around the time we started getting active right. and engaged. And honestly, there was a phenomenal interest from the very outset of our work that far exceeded anything we had on the ground. You know, Iman was just setting up basic programs. Like, we had, a, we had a program that was dealing with youth mentorship. We started, we had our first taking it to the streets in 1997, and it was kind of like this small revolution of sorts because it was an epiphany for all of these sectors of the community that had been separated from one another to actually not only engage one another publicly, but engage the public in the process of doing so. So in a very, I'd say in a nutshell, we were very much kind of an organization whose time has come, and in many ways were beneficiaries of all these extraordinary things, these 
movements and phenomena that was happening before us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people were excited to get boots on the ground, support us, engage us, because oh. immigrants were not working really intensely with young African Americans. Young African Americans weren't working intensely with you know, sectors of, they, you know, the, the stones, they were shocked to find Palestinian kids growing up saying they're Muslim, but identifying also with the black stones by virtue of the neighborhoods hmm. that they were brought up in. Huh. So all of that was, I think, part of the history of Islam taking root in an urban center like Chicago. Hmm. May Allah continue to make you a success. I mean. When we're talking about Islam and our community and what's happening and trying to understand it, you almost inevitably go right back to Imam Wahidi Muhammad. I've rarely had a conversation with you about our community that you don't go, not just here, I mean, you, you kind of go to this place, and I know that has a lot to do with the time you spent with him, some of the stories that you shared with me. And, and I think Imam Muhammad, may Allah have mercy on him, you talk about the values of khidmah and service. This was a leader who was utterly, absolutely, just in complete service to his community and to humanity. When you understand the life of Imam Muhammad, may Allah have mercy on him, uh, he precipitates the largest mass migration to Islam in America and perhaps in the West, right? And it is Imam Muhammad's up until his dying day, um, and I was very blessed to be with him three days before he passed. You know, I was in his house, which at one point he could have lived in a mansion. He could have lived in, you know, I was up into uh, a home, a very, very humble home that barely had enough room for three of us to sit and have a meeting. Um, and it was because that place for us to have a meeting was right by the door, we were interrupted uh, maybe five, seven times during the course of that meeting by little knocks on the door. And it was, it was children in the neighborhood who were coming to his house. Um, and he would get up and say, you know, he would excuse, he would really be prof just profusely apologetic to me, excuse himself, get up and go get fruit and candy and give them to the kids. At one point, literally an elderly woman came in and interrupted again and, uh, and he, kept asking her about her health and everything. And, and um, he said, the bag, bag of, the, the bag of groceries are there for you. He didn't even want to say it loudly because he didn't want to point. But she went to his kitchen and came out with a bag of groceries that she was clearly there to pick up. Um, and the only reason he stopped her from even talking, because at one point he said, you know, he said, please forgive me, sister. I don't want to be rude to my guest. That was me. You know, and so she left. When I was with Imam Muhammad, and this is just another sign of his, what I, I honestly believe he was among the awliya and, and just one of those that you know, truly had a maqam that many people didn't get an opportunity to fully appreciate. But uh, I was sitting with him, and at one point, he said something to me. He said, Rami, my whole life I've been, because you know, another thing about Imam Muhammad, he was kind of criticized often by not you know, giving the hadith in Arabic and citing in Arabic and, you know, people were saying, you're not talking about the prophetic sunnah enough, you're not, blah, blah, blah. You're not Muslim enough. But one thing he said to me, he said, you know, Rami, my whole life I've been trying to point them to Muhammad. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa That's it. My whole life is an arrow to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And when he said that, it made me think of the same brothers who were attacking him in the name of sunnah, right? And I had them in my mind. And so I started saying, I started saying something like this. I started saying, Imam, it's just ironic, you know, that people, you know, that who, who quote unquote, love the sunnah and the hadith and, you know, have said certain, and he stopped me. He stopped me. And he said, Rami, he says, there's always good in the community of the Prophet Muhammad, right? There is always good, right? He didn't even let me go there. He didn't let me go there. All he could talk about was the beauty of the Muslims, right? And this is a person who had probably been viciously attacked by Muslims for a good period of his life, right? And that, that was the character of Imam Muhammad, may Allah have mercy on him. And, and honestly, we, you know, we owe a lot to that legacy. I always tell the Palestinians, I'm Palestinians, uh, 
I always say, listen, man, and I go back to my uncle, that one of the stories I started off with. I have an uncle who's, whose name was Muhammad, but he's Mickey now, right? I can't get him back to Muhammad. And it was ironic that at a moment where in America you had the Mikes, you had the Muhammads, and the Mahers going to the Mikes and the Mickeys, you had the Cassius, and you had the, you know, you had the, 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 the Mikes going to Muhammad and Ali, to the point where it is Muhammad, right? The idea of this extraordinary name gets elevated to a point in this country where we can call it a bona fide American name because of what they endured. The legacy of those who came underneath Imam Muhammad, came through the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they made that name a, they made it honestly a respected prophetic name in America. I mean, you people remember the fight, Muhammad Ali, right? What's my name? What's my name? Some of you may remember, who was it? Was it Sonny Liston? Was it one of the, one of the dudes? What, who was it? Patterson. Patterson, yeah. Where he was extending the fight because Patterson, all up until the time of the fight, was saying, Cassius. you know, call him Cassius. Cassius. And in those, those interviews, he's saying, call me Muhammad. Call me Muhammad. He, said, call, he kept calling, he was taunting him publicly, call him Cassius. So when he got in the ring, that was one of the fights that our beloved brother extended a little longer. He could have dropped him probably in the <laughs> second, third round. But I think he kept the fifth, sixth, seventh round just to keep him up, hit him a couple times and say, what's my name? Allah, say my Allah, name. Allah, 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 say my name. Allah, right? Say my name. Allah. Say Muhammad. Let me hear you say it. Right? Now, that, that was powerful, right? Can you imagine the psychology of people seeing a champion elevate the name Muhammad? Allah, right? Allah, Allah. Allah. And that's what, these, that's what this community did. That's what this community did. So for us to come, and, and that was the insult to injury for kind of immigrant community to come and feel, now let me teach you Islam, right? Dude, you wouldn't be able to even walk on these blocks. And, and, and you know, Dr. Jackson talks about Islam as a circle, right? You heard him talk about Islam as a big circle. And we have to be a community that accommodates a circle. I would extend, and he and I have talked about extending this theory a little further, and, and this is important when we talk about level of practice. You know, there may be those in that kind of tight center of that circle that outwardly look a certain way, that are praying five times a day. They're right in the heart of the circle. But historically, Islam, like in the laws of physics, has always benefited disproportionately from the ability of having many people on the edge of that circle. Whoa, whoa. When you have a larger circle, you have a more powerful centripetal force, right, that draws people to the center of that circle. And those people on the outlines of that circle are often the people who are on the edges, mm -hmm. right? And mass conversion, Dr. Ahmad and others, typically happens on the edges. Those people are on the edge of society, and you have to respect and appreciate those. One anecdotal thing that I remember, one year we were in the heart of this hood. It was, it was a neighborhood known as Motown. Right, it was the heart of Blackstone territory, probably one of the largest coherent Blackstone territories and gang territories in the city. And we had a tabliki jama'ah, beautiful brothers come. They, they kept saying, there's beautiful brothers. They wanted to come and they wanted to do, you know, the thing where they walk around the neighborhood. <laughs> and I said, cool, you know, we'll walk around the neighborhood. Now, it was everyone in their whole thing, the, the sawal kamis. And the, the brothers were walking around and they were just, they were kept getting shocked because their kind of thing is take us to Muslims. But in a neighborhood like that, those porous borders between who's Muslim and not Muslim, you know, everyone was saying Aslam Laikum. That's right. Now they would have said Aslam Laikum, right? Or Aslam Laikum, or Laikum, or Laikum Salam, or whatever they said, but, but everyone was saying it. And one brother, you know, gave him. There was, there was one brother who was like on the edge, but you know, he was, we, he was his name was Brother Tariq. And all day long, Tariq, you know, had some issues, but he would be like, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Right? And, and the Tabligi brothers were like, Mashallah, you know, like Islam. You know, brother, we have a bayan after Salat al Asr in the masjid. And the, the brother's like, you know, Tariq, he's just listening. Oh, alhamdulillah, Allah, <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, they go going back and forth. And, 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 getting, and the brothers are listening to the story. And they're like, yeah, mashallah, we'll see you inshallah after Asr. Brother, bayan, 
Well, I'm the la la And the brothers, the brothers are walking away, not knowing what to make of it. And all of a sudden, we're, we're halfway the block, and I'll never forget we hear, "Get down on it, get down on it." And, and, we, and the brothers look back, and Tariq is doing this funky dance in the, in the middle of the street. He, he had this real funky apparel of it was like part cape, part kufi, part turban, you know. And, and the brothers just didn't, you know. <laughs> They just, is he going to come to the Bayan? I was like, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know. But, but, here's the thing. It's because of the brothers like Tariq that you can walk around That's here right. in a shawal al kamis, right. right, and get love and respect. That's right. Right? Because there are enough brothers on the edges that, you know, who still find within Islam enough relevance to connect to, engage with, right, that power. And, it, and, it's, and it's the movements like Imam Muhammad's community and those who came that often don't get the recognition they deserve that have made Islam relevant in ways that I think we all find extraordinary inspiration from and need. The short version of Iman is we're, we're in the heart of uh, inner city neighborhood and dealing with social justice issues services and arts that are directly affected by and intended to inspire the environment in which we are in. Now we mobilize resources, people, and communities across the country to attempt to do that. But one thing that I fundamentally believe in and what has always kept me, I think, driven to do the work is um, my path to Islam came through <laughs> this belief that Islam is fundamentally transformative. Right? That Islam is ultimately a socially, spiritually transformative force that can reckon with anything that the human being confronts. I fundamentally believe that as daunting challenging, tiring, fatiguing as the problems are in urban communities across America, but they're not unlike, honestly, problems that are confronting urban communities across the globe. Mm -hmm. And if that if Islam is going to be real for me, it has to be real for the environment that we're in. And if Muslims don't see or regard Islam as transformative in, 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 in communities and spaces, that are absolutely critical to the very fabric of the nation in which we reside, then I think there's a big part of our spiritual identity that is missing.